Hey, it's Adam Ragusea, and I'm afraid of bread. Certain bread. Some bread is very easy to make, but most breads require actual technique and actual willingness to measure stuff, and these are things that I generally lack. So later in this episode, we're going to do failure of the week, as always, and I have a thing to say about carbs and the sensation of hunger. But first, let's get some bread baking tips from a man so handsomely slender you would think he eats no bread at all, but you'd be wrong because he is one hell of a baker. YouTube cook Brian Lagerstrom. Subscribe to his channel. My background is professional chef. I did that for about 10 or 11 years. Uh, I did professional bread baking as well for about three years. And I kind of combined those two experiences on my channel to bring like kind of a professional's perspective to home cooking. All the recipes are sort of uh, geared towards the home cook, but there's always some sort of like professional aspect, like some technique that I've used or just some attention to detail that I bring that I think brings a little bit of a unique perspective. So as you know, uh, my only professional cooking experience is in uh, uh, assembling MTOs, which are subs at uh, this uh, mid-Atlantic convenience store chain called Sheets. Um, Really got a lot of of experience there that I carry with me, um, mostly about just doing anything I can do to never have a real job again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so like, you know, I'm just, I'm just making stuff up as I go along at home. And I also don't like really like measuring things or trying. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I usually just like bake flatbreads, right? I bake pizzas, I bake naan because I just feel like the, the degree of difficulty there and the mar is very small. The margin for error is huge. You know, you can do all, you can commit all manner of sins as a baker. And as long as the bread is flat, like it's going to, you're going to get something reasonably tasty at the end. Um, you bake all kinds of breads. What's the basic difference in approach between a flat naan and a big puffy, you know, French loaf? Well, like you said, flatbreads are super forgiving, and I think that's why it's a great place for most people to start. There's really kind of like a few differences when between that and like a fully risen loaf. The main one that I would consider is just fermentation in general. For a risen loaf, something that we would call a boule or a batard. There's going to be like a secondary fermentation or like a final rise. And that's really like the main thing that distinguishes the two. The difficulty level is obviously much higher because when it comes to getting a loaf of bread that's properly risen into something that you could score and then bake, you have to pay attention to a few other things. One is strength building. Um, And when I say strength building, I'm really just referring to sort of like the development of the gluten gluten proteins inside of the wheat, um, how you hydrate those, the wheat and the flour and how you develop those gluten networks uh, has a huge impact on how the loaf stands up in the oven, if it can stand up in the oven. And flatbreads, it doesn't really matter. Like you could use 8% very weak flour and barely knead it and still be able to have it hold on to its basic shape and put sauce and stuff on top of. But um, aside from the strength thing though, fermentation, not just secondary, like I mentioned before, but the entire process of fermentation is a lot more important. You need to have a leaven that is going to uh, predictably produce gas over the time frame that you want, whether that's a poolish, which would be a yeasted one or sourdough pre-ferment. If you're just doing a straight dough, which means no pre-ferment poolish sourdough, you still need to know exactly how much yeast is going to, uh, or how much gas the yeast you're using is going to produce because you're going into a secondary fermentation. So you have to have a um, understandable amount of gas in that thing to to be able to shape it and have that thing continue to rise and stay strong. Um, So the fermentation, the strength, and then uh, this is long-winded, but the last thing would be just shaping. Like flatbread, you're just kind of pressing it into something that you then bake, like a pizza, for example. But Um, taking a developed dough and then folding it, rolling it into a baguette or a batard or whatever, like that takes a few tries. So let's break that down. So the primary fermentation, the first fermentation is there, um, you know, we'll, we'll get gas, we'll get a rise if we just mix yeast and water and flour, right? It'll rise. But mostly why we're doing that is to, is to let the yeast 
um, you know, metabolize sugars in there and create flavor compounds and all that kind of stuff. And exactly. some amount of gas, um, you know, little seed bubbles such that like if you just did a primary fermentation, it puffs up, you flatten it down again and then throw it in the oven. Like you'll have a decent little kind of flatbread. It won't be like a cracker. Um, it totally. won't be like a, it won't be like an unyeasted loaf, which if anyone wants to see what one of those looks like, I did a video recently. I'll link it uh, in the show notes, but where I, I actually baked some pizza dough with no yeast at all in it. And, you know, you get a little bit of leavening just from the steam that's in there, sure. just kind of pushing up and kind of creating <laughs> little teeny bubbles. But mostly it's just like a wet, thick cracker. And the, and the flavor is repulsive because there's, because like wet, wet flour doesn't taste very good. What tastes good is fermentation, right? Yeah. So, so that's your primary fermentation, right? And then what you're talking about is like, you do the fr primary fermentation, you punch the dough down to kind of, and, and I think the reason, there's a few reasons to do that. One is it, it develops gluten a little bit more. Another is that it, it redistributes the, the nutrients around the, the yeast. And so they can come into contact with new stuff to ferment and all that kind of stuff. And then- you get it kind of in a basic shape like you want it. This, and then you have the secondary fermentation where it puffs up mm -hmm. and then you don't punch it down again. It's the puffed up thing. That's what you put in the oven. And that's right. what makes it big and puffy in its yeah. final baked form, right? That is the like loaf. Yeah, that's it yeah. for sure. Um, actually, let's back up. What happens if you don't do that? You ever done this? You ever just like done a primary fermentation? You don't punch it down. You just throw it straight into the oven. You could just take that primarily risen, one, once risen, unpunched down dough and put it in the oven. And that's basically ciabatta. Um, ciabatta is not really shaped. If you, if I don't, I'm, I'm sure you have not seen my ciabatta video. You probably have plenty of other things going on. I have seen your, I have seen your ciabatta video, please. Um, anyways, that's just a slab of dough that you gently cut in half and then do everything you can to not degas it. So the parchment paper actually for the home cook is more effective than how you would do it in the professional bakery because to do things at scale, you just can't have a uh, hundred pieces of parchment with dough on it. If you're going to make a hundred ciabattas or whatever. So you have to like flip the dough over, um, to get it onto the peel from where you're proofing it. And, you know, you degas it pretty significantly. So the home cook is at unique advantage in that sense where they're just, here's a small slab of dough, cut it in half, cut the parchment up the middle and then slide both pieces into the oven undisturbed. And you get an unbelievably open crumb that way. There's no other way to get a crumb that open. And when I say crumb, um, you know, just the sort of irregular holes inside the bread. Yeah, yeah. There's no real way to get that um, in another at home in another style of bread. I suspect there's there's two reasons why that works well with ciabatta. Just one fermentation, one and done, right? One is that it's an incredibly high hydration dough, right? Like it's tons of water. And mm -hmm. the more water you have in a dough, the more it needs itself, right? Through the chemical action of... of um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, autolyzing mm -hmm. um, through the the agitation of the yeast fermentation, bubbling around and moving mm -hmm. things around, and the dough will kind of knead itself a little bit more. Um, and then two, because there's so much water in there, um, you're going to get like you're going to get a, a oven spring, right? Um, yes. Where like the the water converts to steam and it puffs up, it leavens the dough, like something like you know, uh, an example would be for folks um, like Yorkshire pudding. Exactly. Um, which is just milk and eggs and fat and flour. And there's no leavener at all in there. But the reason it puffs up is because it's incredibly wet. And so you, it mm -hmm. steams. Like I, I made pancakes. I, I make pancakes for my kids like a couple mornings a week. And yeah, that's real. God, they get up so early. I hate them. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, you talk about like your brain not being awake. Like I, I have left every single ingredient out of pancake batter at one point or another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they still lift. Yeah. And they still lift just fine. I've left out the baking powder. They lift just fine. Right. Yeah. Um, it's like mostly the steam you get in something that is so wet that it's not even a dough. It's a batter. Right. Totally. So I, I reckon that's why ciabatta works with that kind of primary fermentation only. One thing that I've noticed in my own pizza baking is that like 
you know, I used to do this thing where like I would mix my dough really roughly. I would put, divide it into these individual little d- dishes, you know, single portion containers, and then I would throw them in the fridge for a week and that was it. Like I would just one fermentation, one long ass fermentation and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then one thing that I noticed, and I can't decide if I like it better or not, is if I do a primary fermentation, like a bulk fermentation, so everything goes in the bowl, I let it rise for two hours on the counter or sometimes overnight in the fridge, I mm-hmm. come down come back, punch it down, divide it into uh, the bowls, and then let those rise individually again in the fridge. Mm-hmm. What that gets me is like a fluffier uh, cornice, you know, like a fluffier yeah, yeah. crust around the edge and a stronger kind of chewier texture. And I, so I suspect that one reason that p- doing two distinct fermentations is advantageous or evolved is that it just, it actually, it creates more kneading, right? Because after the, the, in that primary fermentation, it's not just fermentation that's happening. It's also autolyzing where the, you know, water causes the proteins, the gluten proteins, which by the way, I liked how you caught yourself earlier. You were going to say glutenin and gliadin instead of saying gluten proteins, because (laughs) here on the internet, some asshole is guaranteed to say there's no protein called gluten. It's actually glutenin and gliadin or whatever the hell they're called. And that are then mixed with water and create a network that we call gluten but brian knows that i know that so if you've already made that comment go ahead and delete it right now sir you almost certainly are a sir by the way yeah totally and if you ever think about how to correct me on saying worcestershire i know that it said worcester sauce you guys i get it like (laughs) we universally corrected on that i did that in a recent video and i still and i even did a little like pop-up bubble like i know how it's just because i thought it was funny to mess it up 20 comments in the first hour so whatever you guys are out there you're cool thanks for commenting <laughs> yeah. thanks for watching but you know maybe don't if you're one of those guys yeah. that's what i said anyway um secondary yeah. and primary fermentation um will is also just creates kneading benefits for getting a stronger a, a stronger gluten network for breads that require that or where that's a desirable thing now one thing that you mentioned brian is that like a problem that you might run into trying to bake a tall bread, a loaf, is that you might not be able to control the amount of gas that's produced. And if you get too much, um, the the loaf collapses, right? Mm -hmm. And is there, and and then like, is there any way back from that? Not in my experience. I mean, I've gotten this question a lot on just in the comments section of my channel and it can still be turned into food for sure. (laughs) Like, um, bake pizza, right? Exactly. You know, just yeah. whatever, ver- you know, I'm sure if you just take your pizza dough out of the fridge after a week and you were to do this to it, let it just sit there for an hour and then throw it in the oven, everybody in your house would be stoked to have that to snack on. Um, but you're not going to be like making sandwiches out of it, you know? Um, but you, you definitely can. The problem, you know, with, with overproofing in general is that you've, you've expended a lot of the energy that exists in the bread already through the fermentation process, especially if you're doing a nearly 100% or 100% white bread, there's just not a lot of food in there. Um, they run out, you know, they get really tired. Yeah. You no, know, there's still plenty of like carbs. There's plenty of sugar for the yeast to eat, but they don't just the yeast are, are they're, they're like us. Man cannot live on sugar alone, right? <laughs> like, yeah. They need like micronutrients and stuff, other things that are, are more abundant in like a whole wheat dough, but in a white dough, they're going to, they're going to blow through those micronutrients pretty quickly. Yeah. And just the rate of fermentation will drop significantly. It'll definitely continue producing gas for a very long period of time. Like if you've ever thrown old dough into a giant trash can, like I have <laughs> before, you know, you come back and it comes uh, back it, to eat you. Yeah. Like it's been sitting in the dumpster behind the bakery for two days before the truck comes. And all of a sudden that bag is like going to explode because it's, it's been outdoors in the heat, you know, but um, there is like a gradient and this is just my, my anecdotal experience. Like there's so much science to baking that, um, you know, I, th- that's for other people to understand. I know enough to, to commercially produce bread every day, but, um, you know, for just in my anecdotal experience, like there is a real drop off in terms of, uh, sort of like, uh, I don't know, veracity, vigorousness of fermentation. Yeah. 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 No, it totally makes sense. All right. So the other reason I get scared about uh, baking tall loaves is the scoring process where you've got like a beautiful bulbous proofed dough and you're supposed to take a very sharp knife 
and like slash it. And yeah. every time I have done this, terrible things have happened. Why do we do this and how do we do this? <laughs> yeah. So one of the biggest problems is that most home bakers aren't baking or they're not putting cold dough into their oven. At the professional level, at least in the bakeries I worked in, almost 100% of the doughs that are getting baked are coming from the refrigerator. Just because they were done so far in advance? Yeah, just like it's easier to manage when if you're going to make 400 loaves of bread, it's better to, and the sort of choke point is the oven itself. You can't have 400 loaves sitting there when you have a 72 loaf oven, you know? Um, But there's also like tons of reasons flavor wise, fermentation wise, why you would use just for pizza dough is a similar way. 100% of the sourdough that we baked, every single sourdough bread would get put in the cooler overnight. And that's just like, in my experience, standard practice. Oh, it tastes way better, I think. Yeah, and it's way easier to bake. You get it you, for a whole host of reasons. You get a wider variety of flavors. The texture, the out, exterior, the crust is way better. There's like a thousand different colors of brown and gold on the outside of an overnight risen loaf. But if you're doing it same day, that's one of the biggest problems is a room temperature loaf of bread, even if it's been shaped by professional hands and it is as tight as it can get, and it's very strong and perfectly proofed, it's still going to be hard to get that like perfect score, even with a brand new razor blade. Um, somebody, you know, the baguette is kind of the exception to the refrigerator rule uh, in the professional sense. Cause that's like a same day, quick kind of a bimbo bread. You know, it's, it's not really meant to be sourdough. It's supposed to be yeasty and kind of, kind of just like light, silly. Um, and so it goes from bowl to oven in six hours, which is very short for the bakery I worked in. And, um, so they would be sitting on the floor. Some of them would go into the refrigerator because, you know, you're not going to make 12 baguettes, bake 12 baguettes. You're going to, you're going to make 48 baguettes, bake 12, bake 12 later in the day. So they're always coming out fresh so that some of them would be cold, but the first round would always be room temperature. And I would just snag the blade consistently. And the scores just look terrible. You can degas the dough that way. So cold dough would be my number one tip. The other two are practice shaping. If you have a, a loaf of bread that is properly strengthened and the tension has been created on the outside from your hands, um, that's going to make a huge difference. That sort of internal tension gives you, um, I couldn't tell you what the word is. I don't know if it's surface tension, but it's stretched in a way that makes it way easier. Slack doughs are impossible to score. And the other is properly fermented. Overproof dough <clears throat> is impossible to score. Underproof dough is easy to score, but nothing's going to happen when you put it in the oven. It's not going to, it's not going to like bloom. So We'll talk more with Brian Lagerstrom in just a second. We'll find out exactly how you shape the dough such that you've got that tight skin on top that can withstand the scoring. But first, let me tell you about uh, my tight new kicks, courtesy of the sponsor of this podcast, Vessi. Vessi is a sneaker company up in the rainy wilds of Vancouver, British Columbia that makes 100% waterproof sneakers. Waterproof sneakers that do not look like frumpy little booties. They are elegant, modern, sleek fashion sneakers that you can work out in, but you can also wear to work. The designs are really classy. I've been wearing a pair for almost a year now. They're made out of a material called Dynatex, which is vegan, if that matters to you. And it's kind of magic. It's this super lightweight material that is also breathable, yet it is waterproof for walking through the rain or the snow. And it keeps you warm in the winter and cool in the summer. I live in a hot, wet place, and these are Perfect for me. Vessi is spelled V-E-S-S-I. Go to Vessi.com slash Adam and use my code Adam to get $25 off each pair of adult Vessi shoes. Get your classy, comfortable, waterproof sneaks for $25 off with my link and code in the show notes. Free shipping to the countries where most of you are, by the way. Thank you, Vessi. Okay, back to Brian on bread, and we are going to talk about shaping the dough. So yeah, the the Sort of simplest uh, process of steps would be mix the dough, primary fermentation, uh, pre-shape the dough. So you flip it out of the bowl, you make it into a relative round shape that you then can shape. After you've pre-shaped, you actually do the final shaping to make it look like a baguette or a boule or whatever. You proof that, then you bake it. So it goes from primary, pre-shape, shape, proof, bake. Those are like the main Okay, so you've got your primary fermented dough. How do you fold it to get that taut skin on it? 
Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it and it kind of depends on the shape of bread that you're doing. But um, if we're, let's just say we're trying to make the most simple, rustic, round loaf of bread. Yeah. The easiest way that I would say is, let's say you have just a chunk of dough in front of you, right? It's, it's maybe a kilo or whatever. Put your hand in the middle, pull it out till you, till you feel tension and then fold it back over. Almost make like a starfish maneuver all the way around. Pull it out, fold it to the middle, pull it out, fold it to the middle. The side that's facing the table and primarily you, you want a little flour between the table yeah. and the bread, yeah. obviously. That, can, that, that creates a lot of problems for people. Um, that's going to be the top of your loaf. So I would say go around five, six, seven, eight times until you feel like you can't really get it much tighter. There's a million factors that go into this, but that would be the easiest way you could possibly sh- shape like what's called a loaf of bread. There's tons of very uh, advanced ways to get strength. And most of the dough that I've worked with professionally is super, super wet. Like the average person wouldn't be able to even touch it without it just completely sticking to their hands. So how you shape those, there's there's 20 little folds you have to do to get that like into a unit. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you've, you've effectively done that. You've got a nice taut skin on the top. You've given it its secondary fermentation. It's proofed. It's puffy. It has not proofed so long that it then pops like a bubble and collapses. It's good to go. It's strong enough and cold enough, therefore firm enough for you to mm-hmm. slash. Why do you slash it? When you score it, <clears throat> you're giving the loaf itself sort of a weak point to break itself through. If you proof the loaf properly, there's a lot of potential energy in there in uh, yeast will bring some rise. The uh, in the in the steam from the from the dough itself brings rise. And if you don't give it somewhere to go, it'll find a place. Like if you were to not score it, you'll see like around the bottom there'll be a little. It'll score it for you. It'll rip itself open. Right. And um, you know those loaves are just smaller. They're denser. And uh, you know it's it's kind of like the salt thing. It just doesn't taste as good. As you know, like air is a big part of the flavor of food. And if there isn't enough air in the thing that you're used to, like if your palate isn't getting enough of that like space in there, it's Mm -hmm. just different and weird. Like, so if you have a very dense loaf of bread, it just tastes different. Right. So professional baking ovens, I've never, I've seen it. I've never seen one in operation. I've seen one like in a, in like a factory store, they have like steam injectors, right? Like they can steam the interior of the oven. Yeah. And so it's, we call them a deck oven. So you know, if, unless you're like a super industrial scale, but let's say it's like five or six feet wide, the, the area that the loaf goes in is maybe 18 inches tall. And there's some masonry on top and bottom, um, whether that's like real stone or fake stone or just thick steel or whatever. Um, so it's being heated from the top and the bottom. And then you load your loaves in, you close it. And the entire thing is just completely filled with steam for 15 to 20 minutes, depending on your style. And then you can uh, pull a damper and all the steam escapes and then you do dry baking for the second half of the right. bake. And it makes an unbelievable difference. That's, you know, aside from the learning how to ferment properly, shape properly, like the one thing that really separates professional level bread. And I, and I don't mean like, you know, the kind available at the, um, in the mall parking lot, strip mall ca- bakery cafe. Yeah. I mean like real deal stuff is steam. Like it's, it's a huge ingredient in the quality. Right. So the steam basically as I understand it makes the surface of the loaf more uh, elastic as it's baking and thus the loaf can puff up more and the outer layer becomes like gossamer thin. Right. Mm -hmm. And which then, and and I'm sure there's other like chemical stuff that happens to the actual starches. They, they pre-cook, they, they gelatinize, right. Um, Which makes them more likely, more able to myartify or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Once you, suck out the steam and then you get that final blast of dry heat on that surface and it crackles up. Yeah. To set that thin crust, which, you know, uh, is if you're doing, if you're doing your job right is, you know, the thing that is like sort of to strive for, you know, a lot of people concentrate on like open crumb or at least me as like a baker, you know, like used to follow 50 Instagram accounts to be like, what does the inside of their bread look like? You know, at this one bakery in LA (laughs) or whatever, but really what matters is like the sort of, experience of the crust. You know, if you're not very good at sourdough, the crust can be kind of punishing. The flavor of the bread is going to be good, but the like experience of getting your teeth through it is going to be like just too challenging and not huh. very pleasurable. I wonder so. why. Is that because of the the low pH, the high acidity of sourdough? Yeah. 
exactly. And, and, but then also like that gets compounded by um, like what the, the thing, the things you said, which it is not allowed to reach its full potential in the oven when the acid is too high. It just right. makes a thicker crust. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, and I, like, I wish I could tell you exactly why, but I don't, I don't know why. Acid weakens gluten because science. Um, <laughs> so lastly, Brian, um, in terms of replicating that steam environment at home, mm-hmm. what I've done that I thought I, I've been really pleased with the results is get like a spray bottle of water and you just go into the oven and you spray, you spray the loaf a few times in the early stages of baking. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only downside there is that it lets out heat, but if you're quick about it, it hasn't, isn't, isn't such a big problem. Um, any other tips, any better ways of getting steam into your oven at home? Yeah, there's, there's like a spectrum of complexity that you could do. Like I've rigged up some pretty weird stuff to like actually replicate a steam injected up in here. Um, the spray bottle is the easiest, but you're going to get the less, the least amount of result as well. Um, you'll, you'll get, you'll get some of the benefits, but not all, you know, there'll still be a wide gap between what you can make at home and what you could go buy. Um, you can, I would highly recommend going out and buying a lodge logic combo cooker, Dutch oven. Um, it's like $40 on Amazon and that might even include shipping actually. Don't quote me on that. But, um, I used to make 16 loaves of bread in the restaurant I worked at in those every day because they're so effective at holding heat, transferring that heat to cold, wet dough, and then also trapping steam. Um, yeah, so I would, I would make like 16, uh, one and a half kilo sourdoughs every day for like three straight years in those. I highly recommend them. Um, but then a cheaper way to sort of go beyond the spray bottle, but, and get better results, but for almost no money is to use like a grocery store foil pan, like a big Turkey roasting pan and, you know, load your dough right onto your pizza stone or steel. I imagine a lot of people who watch our videos who are into like would be potentially making bread. They probably already have a pizza steel or stone. Yeah, something um, like that, yeah. Yeah. Or whatever, you know, the back of a sheet tray, um, and then cover that with a foil pan that will trap a lot more steam just from the bread itself. You don't even need really to spray. I've done it. Oh, just I, like tent tenting it with the foil tenting the the loaf. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I did a video like a month and a half ago called beginner baguette. And the idea was, um, none of the fancy bakery tricks, but like enough of the stuff that really matters to give you a result that is crusty and fun. Um, and that's how I did it. So basically you, you make these tubes and put them on a piece of parchment. You slide that piece of parchment onto the back of a sheet tray. The there's like five different foil pans at the grocery store that almost perfectly fit on top of a half sheet tray size. Some are oval, some are rectangle. They all cost like $3. And then you flip that on, throw it in your oven and all of the steam that comes from the bread when it bakes is trapped and you get a pretty good result. Nice. All right, Brian, I'm going to make a, I think I'm going to make a recipe video where I attempt my first like actual loaf of bread on the channel. And when it uh, comes out bad, uh, everybody can uh, (laughs) just go over to Brian's channel and uh, blame him. Oh, dude, I can't wait to see it, man. You always have such novel ideas that I think are so interesting and well thought out. So I can't wait to see what you come up with. Yes. I'm like a feral child in the woods, just like inventing inventing the wheel because he's never seen a wheel before. And my wheel comes out like a trapezoid because I don't know any better. Dude, one of the most Ragusea things ever that I love so much was the cake pan pizza. Oh my God. What a great idea, dude. Oh yeah. That, that was, that was dangerous. Like my, my holiday weight gain this past year was chiefly due to the cake pan pizza recipe. Be careful with that one, everybody. Yeah. Well, because those bready thick pan pizzas, like they're, it's not like a thin crust. You will eventually get full from the amount of cheese in your stomach when eating a thin crust pizza because the ratio is so much like yeah. higher. It's just a heavier food. But with the breadier pizzas, man, watch out, dude. It takes a long time to like for your brain to be like, stop. Yeah, dangerous. But you wouldn't know anything about that, you slender son of a bitch. <laughs> dude, I have to give away most of the pizzas that I make on this channel, man. Do you have neighbors? Yeah, I've got a really sweet... Uh, 65 year old woman who lives next door who eats really well. I had some people on the other side too, who were total pizza heads, but they, they moved. Unfortunately, I have to go like to the new person now with like gifts being like, do you like meatballs? Cause I have (laughs) nine pounds. (laughs) (laughs) Brian Lagerstrom on YouTube. Go check him out. He's like me, but 
taller and better at cooking. So really not like me at all now that I come to think of it, but if you like me, you'll probably like his videos. Good videos. Hey, why does the cheese on the pizza fill you up faster than the bread? And is that even really true? Feels true to me, but we're going to talk about that more in just a second. First, it's time for failure of the week. This week, it's actually kind of a non-failure because circumstances conspired to save me from myself on both of these failures. So Lauren said the other day that she wanted shrimp for dinner, which was unusual because we basically never cook animal protein on a weekday anymore other than like eggs. So she said that she wanted shrimp and I figured that I should provide. I made her basically the scampi recipe that I did on YouTube a couple of years back, except with rice instead of pasta. Lauren likes rice. I got some jasmine rice cooking in a pot and I did not wash it because I'm a heretic who likes clumpy rice. And yet that rice did not come out clumpy or gluey or starchy at all, which is an experience I've been having quite often lately. I wonder if certain manufacturers have improved their processes such that there is little, if any, free starch, any starch powder on the grains left after the processing. This rice came out perfectly fluffy, which ironically is not what I was aiming for, even though everybody else on the planet seems to be into that. I do wonder if washing is becoming totally pointless with at least certain makes and models of rice that seem to have no free starch coat on them anymore. But anyway... While the rice was cooking, I peeled and deveined some wild-caught domestic shrimp that I bought. I peeled and chopped a shallot and an absurdly huge pile of garlic. I know what my lady likes. I melted a film of butter in a pan and I threw in the shrimp. I like to get the first side of shrimp really, really brown. You usually can't get both sides super brown because then they'll be overcooked on the inside, but you can get one side super brown. I flipped them, gave them like 30 seconds on the second side, and then rather than take them out before making a pan sauce in there, I just left them in, assuming that they would get about done cooking on the inside by the time the sauce was finished in the same pan. So shallots in, stir, stir, stir until soft, which is like 30 seconds because shallots cook really quickly. Garlic in, repeat the process, deglaze with a little white wine because it's me. Reduce until almost dry and then turn the heat off. Time to slowly melt in some more butter to basically make a beurre blanc with the reduced wine and stuff that's in the pan. And then I did the trick that I showed in my video from a couple of years ago, where you get the butter melting and into a little pool of butter, you just put a tiny, tiny pinch of xanthan gum. You can get xanthan gum at grocery stores here in the States these days. It is a polysaccharide created via fermentation of sugars by the same species of bacteria that make that black mold-like looking spots that you sometimes see on cauliflower. Fun fact. Anyway, xanthan gum is amazing at stabilizing butter sauces, which is why I put it in there. Nonetheless, I slowly melted in the butter in just the residual heat of the pan so as to not break the natural emulsion of the butter. And there I had my shrimp enrobed in a creamy, garlicky butter sauce. Dynamite. Lauren was outside on the deck, though. She was reading, and it took her a second to get back inside for dinner, and so the shrimp started to get kind of cold, so I turned the heat back on, just on low, under that pan. I spooned the rice out onto the plates, and I was dismayed to find that it was not clumpy at all, but we already covered that. And when I turned back over to the shrimp, the sauce was full-on boiling. It wasn't full-on boiling. It was like an aggressive simmer because my stupid house came with a stupid gas range, and gas ranges cannot hold very low temperatures unless they're specifically designed for that purpose because if they held a temperature that was too low, the flame might go out and then you would end up filling up your kitchen with uncombusted natural gas, and that would be bad. The heat in this pan was easily enough to denature the casein proteins in the butter, thus breaking the emulsion of the sauce. I should have come back to find a pan full of loose, runny, browned butter instead of a velvety sauce, but no. I failed, but my stupid advice actually saved me. With the xanthan gum in there, the sauce never broke. I still don't really understand the mechanism by which xanthan gum does this, given that, according to what I've read, xanthan gum is not technically an emulsifier. An emulsifier, under the strict definition, is a molecule that binds with fat on one end and water on another end. And that's not really what xanthan gum does. It binds with water, which is why it clumps if you try to disperse it in water, which is why it's better to disperse it in fat instead, hence why I put the pinch of xanthan gum into a little pool of butter in the pan. Xanthan gum is a thickener, and I do wonder if maybe it's not actually stabilizing the emulsion, maybe it's simply thickening 
a broken sauce. And you can't really tell the difference because the texture of xanthan gum is very silky and very similar to the texture of a dairy emulsion. I looked up some papers on what xanthan gum does in emulsions, and the mechanism seems really complicated, and I don't understand it. That's something that I should do a video about. So thanks for the idea, podcast. Very attentive listeners may have noticed I did not mention seasoning my shrimp because I forgot to. That's failure number two. I don't know where my head was, but I totally forgot to season the shrimp. But again, I was saved because the shrimp was totally salty enough by itself. All animal meat is a little salty naturally because all animals require salt to live just like we do. So it's in their tissues. And all sea creatures contain a particularly large amount of natural salt because the ocean is salty. But these shrimp were really salty. So salty that the sauce came out perfectly seasoned in addition to the shrimp cooked therein. It was all fine without me putting any salt into the pan. How is this possible? Well, from what I have read, shrimp and other shellfish are often frozen in brine. Shrimp spoil incredibly fast, and so these days they are generally decapitated and frozen right on the boat that caught them. And brine helps them to freeze faster. Salt lowers the freezing point of water, thus allowing you to blanket the shrimp in super chilled sub-zero degrees Celsius water. Faster freezing means less spoilage, and it means smaller ice crystals, which do less cellular damage to the meat than do big ice crystals, and big ice crystals form with slower freezing. You get a much better product at the end if you freeze them very fast, and the brine helps you do that. Plus, if you brine them, you've probably added weight to the shrimp, because salt makes muscle fibers swell up with water, and since shrimp are sold by weight, ka-ching! Anyway... I'm sure that some shrimp on the market is more heavily brined than others. And now I'm worried about over-seasoning shrimp in the future, because I did not season these particular shrimp at all, and they were perfect. Almost as perfect as the coffees that I enjoy from Trade Coffee, proud sponsor of this episode four of the new Ragusea pod. I assume they're proud. I hope they're proud. Because Trade Coffee taught me to like coffee. I was never a coffee drinker until trade entered my life. I was a total noob. I just went to drinktrade.com and I took their quiz. I told them what I imagined I like in a cup of joe, and they started sending me bags in the mail that helped me learn my own palate. Trade works with a huge network of roasters all over to find great coffees. Trade actually has a team of expert tasters who just taste thousands upon thousands of coffees to find stuff for us. And now I know a lot about coffee and I know a lot about what I like. I like very light roasts because light does not mean weak when it comes to coffee. Light means you can actually taste the coffee and not just the roast. Light roasting also usually means higher caffeine. And unfortunately, I'm old now and too much caffeine really messes up my system. So I have been rocking some of this uh, decaf. It is from Orens in New York. It's decaffeinated via the uh, Swiss water process, which I don't have time to explain right now, but look it up. It's good. And I have an inexhaustible pipeline of new and interesting coffees coming to my door all the time thanks to Trade. Right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order, plus free shipping when you go to drinktrade.com slash adamshow. Check that. Adam Show, not just Adam. Drinktrade.com slash Adam Show. Or you can just click the link that is in the show notes. Drinktrade.com slash Adam Show for what amounts to more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz online. Get those pro tasters at Trade finding you something that you'll love. Drinktrade.com slash Adam Show for $30 off. Thank you, Trade. In the case of satiation v. satiety, in the case of satiation v. satiety, why might the thin crust pizza fill you up faster than a thick crust pizza? Thin crust pizza has more cheese and toppings relative to the bread. Bread is mostly carbohydrates. Cheese is mostly fat and protein. <laughs> mostly fat on a per calorie basis. Does fat fill you up faster than carbs? If you read most of the research literature on diet and hunger, especially the older studies, 
they will mostly say no. Fats do not satisfy hunger as effectively as carbs do on a per calorie basis. You gotta remember that fats have nine calories per gram, carbs have four. Especially if you're looking at studies from the late 20th century, you will find nutrition researchers describing carbs as being protective against obesity because they were shown in study after study to satisfy hunger more effectively than a comparable calorie dosage of fats. Now here in the year 2022, that sounds completely absurd. I I don't think I know anybody who thinks that carbs are protective against obesity. And I'm still struggling to understand why those older studies seem so wrong in retrospect. I want to do a video about this, and I'm still struggling to find just the right experts. If you are the right expert, email me, aragusia at gmail, aragusia. My hypothesis is that these studies from the 80s and 90s, these studies were not wrong at all. They were just asking questions that aren't really the right questions for the times we're living in now. My hypothesis is that we in rich countries in the 21st century, we have taken overeating to new and unexplored heights. Our overeating is on a scale that they couldn't possibly imagine back in the 80s. Perhaps when you're only overeating a little, carbs do satisfy you better than fats. But what my theory presupposes is maybe the math changes when you're not just eating too many slices in one sitting, but in fact, you're eating too many pizzas in one sitting. You're massively overeating. Because here's the thing about fats. They are harder for the body to digest than carbs, especially simple carbs like sugar and white flour. Fats delay gastric emptying, which is when the contents of your stomach drop down into your intestines. Fats delay that. I quote now from Schlesinger and Fortran's Gastrointestinal and Liver Disease, 9th edition. Quote, foods with high fat content empty slower than foods with high protein or carbohydrate content. Triglycerides are mixed with gastric lipase. That's the enzyme made by your pancreas that breaks down your fats for you. Triglycerides are mixed with gastric lipase during the initial intragastric phases of digestion. That means digestion in your stomach. And they are broken down to fatty acids and mono or diglycerides before emptying into the duodenum. Duodenum is the very first part of your small intestine. Duodenum is exquisitely sensitive to diet-derived fatty acids, Longer chain fatty acids exposed to the mucosa of the duodenum result in the release of CCK. CCK is a hormone that uh, stimulates the digestion of fat and protein. CCK relaxes fundic tone, decreases antral contraction, and increases pyloric tone, all of which result in delay in gastric emptying. Thus endeth the lesson. I don't really know what that last part means, but... You get the drift. A very, very high fat meal literally fills up your stomach. Maybe fibrous vegetables would do it even faster, but uh, we're not talking about a world where people are uh, stuffing themselves with kale. We're talking about the real world where you're stuffing themselves with pizza. The fat in the cheese delays gastric emptying, which means your stomach literally fills up. And I think that's when I have that feeling of like, oh, I want another slice, but I will literally vomit if I try to jam anything else down my gullet. In contrast, our body can jam down simple carbs a lot faster. Maybe carbs do satisfy us more due to hormone response, insulin, blood sugar, all of that kind of stuff. But in the context of some serious binge eating, fats put the brakes on the process in a far more direct physical way. We can only cram so many fats down the hatch at a time. I suppose we must also consider the distinction between satiation and satiety. As these things are discussed and understood by nutrition scientists whose research literature I read obsessively, even though I am not one of them, and you should know that I am not a scientist. I'm just a nerd who eats and reads a lot. Satiation is the feeling of fullness that you get while you are eating. It's that feeling you get 
when you go to reach for your fifth slice of pizza and you think, God, no, I can't do it. That is satiation. Satiety is the feeling of fullness and satisfaction that makes you unlikely to go back for that now cold slice an hour or two later. So satiation is what ends your meal. Satiety is what delays your next one. Got it? I know from my own experience that simple carbs tend to satisfy my hunger almost immediately. You know, your blood sugar is low. You eat one piece of candy, it provokes a hormonal response and you feel better right away. But I also know that feeling of of eating a ton of candy and feeling very, very satisfied with myself in the moment, but then half an hour later, I'm hungry again. That is satiety, or actually the lack thereof. You eat something that satisfies you in the moment, but makes you hungry again like a half hour or an hour later. That is the lack of satiety. It is unclear to me from the literature and from my own life how fats versus carbs affect satiation versus satiety. And furthermore, it's unclear to me if that math changes when you are obscenely overeating as so many of us are wont to do these days. Maybe fats are less good at satiation, satisfying short-term hunger, when you're only overeating them by a little bit. But when you eat so much fat that your stomach literally can't clear it out as fast as you're jamming it down, maybe in that context, fats really do become quite satiating. And maybe carbs are better at satiety making you feel like you don't need another meal an hour later, which is what many studies, especially old studies, have found. But, you know, which carbs? I have read studies where the diets described were like oatmeal and whole wheat bread and other slow digesting carbs. Who eats that anymore? This is not that era. This is the era of eating an entire sleeve of prepared raw cookie dough and feeling very sad about it. This is the era of quick carbs. Anyway, these are only some of the questions that I have about the research on diet and hunger and why expert opinion on the subject seems to have shifted so radically in recent years against carbs. I'm really not sure what's going on. I only know that I can pound way more thick crust pizza than thin crust pizza. But I don't even know which of those things is worse. Given that thin crust pizza is likely higher fat because it has proportionally more cheese and fats have more than twice the calories than carbs do per unit of mass, well, maybe the mass of pizza that I am pounding is not really the relevant variable. These are just some questions that I have. I like that the new podcast here gives me a space where I can just kind of spitball a little with y'all and not have all the answers the way that I feel obligated to over in the YouTube videos. I will see you back on YouTube on Monday. I've got a video about distillation and hard liquor that I worked really, really hard on, and I'm very excited for you to see. If you are watching this podcast on YouTube right now, please do subscribe to the Adam Ragusea podcast on your podcast app of choice. I don't know if I'll be posting this to YouTube forever. Podcasts are great, if you didn't know. If you only watch videos, try podcasts. They're like videos, but you're not missing anything if you don't look. And usually the sound is better. Let me know if you have any questions for me. I am doing Q&A on this show and I'm taking Q&A cues over right now in the ratings and reviews for this show on the Apple Podcasts app. So go to the Apple Podcasts app, look for Adam Ragusea's show, leave an actual rating and review, please, like actually review the show because that helps other people find it. But in that, you can leave a question for me to answer on a future program. So uh, find some good stuff to eat that does not completely wreck your body or the planet or anything else. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening.